to the May Here we start again. Welcome everyone to the Utilities Committee meeting, May 10th. We're getting started right away with an update on well number 11. Uh, that'll be you, Jackie. Yep, I'm just trying to get the agenda up here. There, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, well number eleven. I included the um, I, I I couldn't put the entire report in because it was way too big. But I gave you a link to the preliminary engineering report. This report has been sent to the state, and we are waiting for Department of Health to um, give us any comments that they may have on that. So so we're 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 on our way. Um, we also have. Um, uh, we, got, we, we didn't stop working. This is just a preliminary engineering. So they're still working on getting that. This is at 60%. So they're still working on getting to 90% plans. Okay. All right. Um, any and more guess, on that? Or is that's pretty much it? And I guess Jackie did the, the construction. So this was that $500,000 loan that we had for well 11 and then have we already reported that we get the 8 million for the construction? Yes, um, actually that went through the city council when you were out Mark um, at the last meeting in, um, what was last month in April. Um, so the 500,000 original loan was for the preliminary was a pre-design um, or pre-construction. That's what it's called pre-construction loan. And then the 8 million and 80,000 that the board just, um, or the city council just gave Rob the authority to sign and is all well and good now. That's the actual construction loan. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, anything more on that or should we move forward to the foster pilot project update? Who's taking a, a Jackie? Are you giving an update on the foster? Yeah, I get, I, this seems to be the Jackie show today. I guess. Um, <laughs> so um, the foster pilot. Um, I there's a. I, I give you uh, the majority of the report. I took out um, the report. Does actually include all of the lines of lines of lines of um, stream um measurements that they took there was like probably 60 pages of it and i just removed those pages so that you didn't have to wade through them um, but this is our our um, draft stream augmentation report and it shows some of the projects that we're thinking of to use for stream um, augmentation and mitigation and um, we um, are working with trying to work with the tribes i had a phone call with um the Squaxin Island tribes last Friday that was pretty productive about, um, we have a fundamental disagreement basically about the fact that um, we, through our um, consultants, Robinson Noble, have determined that the uh, model error is within 0.5%. So any streams that are, our original thought was any streams that are affected at 0.5% or less, we were going to leave them out because that would be within the model error. So we um, talked to the tribes, they disagreed with that. So we said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll work with you. We'll take it down to 0.4%. So at 0.4, um, that's what how the report is written. And any streams that were um, affected less than that were taken out of the augmentation and mitigation strategies. And the conversation that I had with Squaxin Island last Friday was that, well, we never agreed to that because when, say, the city of Port Orchard has what they can consider a de minimis impact, and then Belfair Water District has what they consider a de minimis impact and so on and so forth, it's accumulative, cumulatively, it is a big impact. So we didn't agree to that. So let's think of some strategies whereby we can um, mitigate for any potential impacts on those streams. Like it could be as simple as helping, for instance, Vaughn Elementary um, has a big area that they irrigate and maybe we find them a, a better way to irrigate that uses less water. And that would be um, a strategy that we could use and count towards that mitigation. So it was a pretty, pretty good conversation. Um, I don't know that we're going to meet 
completely in the middle, but um, we're at least have a good rapport going on with the Squacks and Island tribe anyway. Yeah, I wish, I, I wish Suquamish was going as smoothly. Yes, my, I do too. Okay, um, so the next one, I'm gonna take ownership of this. So the update, so as you know, the splash pad and for I think Mark Trenary mainly, um, because I don't think Mark, you had the full story. Originally when the city council, uh, when we did the McCormick Village Park and we had the splash pad, it was right when Bremerton was having issues with their water park. We chose intentionally to have a flow through system and not a water treatment system. After we got into the system and we had that water moratorium that was issued, we determined that we were putting a lot more water on the ground because of the popularity of the park than we ever thought. And we had agreements with the city of Bremerton, McCormick Communities, South Kitsap Fire. And at one time, McCormick Communities was gonna do the retrofit to the splash pad. Um, and we had an attorney say that we couldn't do that, which I disagreed with because they were building reservoirs and pump stations for us. So why couldn't they just do the splash pad? So we ended up hiring a consultant that designed a very expensive proprietary system that came out of Florida. The original estimates were like 200,000. This came in at 600,000, something like that. So we did a VE and determined that that wasn't a good design. We then ultimately hired a different company uh, to revise certain sections. The original designer um, did not want to participate at all, uh, wanted their, their body work removed. So then we had this firm just do the final design. Um, the latest I think that we updated was that we were going to issue this under two scenarios or two phases. Phase one is having all the materials on hand now, get through this summer. And then the second phase is the actual work to begin, you know, in mid-September of 2022. So all of that is on track as far as schedule. We're still going to be advertising here very soon to get a contractor on board to start procuring materials. The downside at this point is the engineer's estimate with all the, the delay and the COVID stuff is back up to four or $500,000. So, you know, what is it, Jackie? The, oh, 566, but that's with a contingency of. Yeah, the estimated project cost mark is this 472 right here. Yeah, without the contingencies. So, you know, it's crept back up. So it is what it is. I, I'm pretty frustrated by the whole thing, but, you know, we own this. We've, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, if we could have just had McCormick Communities build it originally, um, but we're still less than what we would have if we had gone to that other design, which quite honestly would have been an ex extremely difficult to maintain because they were proprietary parts out of Florida. So I still think that we're doing the right thing. And again, these numbers could go down. Um, this is just the engineer's estimate. You really want your engineer's estimate to be in the middle. So again, I still think we're in, um, you know, we're still less than what we would have on the other one. Oops, I think Cindy's got two of you. So anyway, so that's, uh, uh, that is where we're at on this. We're going to get it out to bid and let's hope we come in somewhere like at 400,000 so that we're less than what it was, but we're not going to be what we thought it might have been, you know, three months ago. So unfortunately, that's where we're at. Hey, Mark. Yeah. So, so again, just as a a follow-up. So we're we're planning on trying to get this done this fall. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna procure. We're gonna advertise it so that the contractor has the ability to purchase all the materials they need for the entire project and get paid for all those materials that are on hand and stored. That way, we don't start the work in September. And we we've determined that we have enough water to run the splash pad this summer. 
So we're going to get through this summer, operate the splash pad with the, I think, you know, we have, we did the same thing last year with certain hour limitations. Right. right. Um, so that somebody's not out there pushing the button at 8 PM. Um, so we've determined that we have the ability to get through the, the summer. That water usage is going to help with our agreement with the city of Bremerton on that water consumption, you know, the 450 reservoir and water main exchange. Um, the main thing we wanted to do is not get into the fall and then suddenly they can't purchase CMU split block because it's delayed. So, so we're, again, we're, we're on schedule. We just, our budget just went up. So, but, you know, I'm on the public works board and we just had a very big robust conversation at the last public works board meeting on construction costs everywhere going out. Um, for projects that can even go forward. So um, we're just living in that world. And again, if we had to somehow been able to, you know, get this done earlier, that would have been great that we we are where we are. So right. so Mark, when when are we actually opening the park for the water with the water splash pad? We'll open it. We typically open it sometime uh, into May, first part of June. Okay. It's, it's, weather, it's kind of weather. It plan, isn't it planned for Memorial Day weekend? Typically, yeah. I mean, but we're also 10 degrees cooler normally right now. So it, it will open the park. You know, I think the park's open right now. The splash pad, it's, we're going to look at temperature. It, there's no reason opening it up and having people, you know, playing in the splash pad when it's 42 degrees. So, you know, and right now I'm not optimistic that we're going to get out of this chill. <laughs> So it, after Memorial, if this weather turns around, but again, we're also going to look at temperatures. Okay, great. Uh, moving on to the water and sewer rate setting policy. Yeah, this will be uh, Jackie or more Noah. Um, I think Jackie will give you an introduction and I think Noah or Nick, I think Nick jumped on. Uh, can provide some some background potentially. So Jackie? Yeah, are you seeing the commercial or comparison of commercial sewer rate structures? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so this is what we have now, and this is what other people have, or what we are compared to um, others in the area. We right now have a total of 21 different categories for billing sewer. Uh, 20 of them are commercial and it's very unwieldy. So figuring out number one, what the CFCs are gonna be, and then, uh, then the regular monthly bill is, is very problematic and it's, it leaves too much to be um, determined by an, an individual. It's not, it's not um, put across the board well enough, I don't think. So and, it's it's been too, con and it's been contentious with existing- Exactly. Building. It's too arbitrary. That's the word I'm looking for. It's too arbitrary. So what we have, we've been talking to Katie um, Isaacson, our financial consultant, and have determined that it would be much better for commercial accounts. Residential accounts would still stay the, stay the same, but commercial accounts would be um, based on a rate structure that is um, based on their usage during the winter months. Um, and that is kind of the trend in rate setting these days. It has been for about the past 10 years. So um, this, this we, I'm, I apologize for not being able to include this and a spreadsheet that I have to come up next when we're done talking about sewer that's about water. Um, I didn't have them on Friday to be able to include in the packet. So I know you're seeing this for the first time. I apologize for that. But um, this, this is what we think is the way to go with our sewer rates. And with that, I'll let Noah or Nick, whoever wants to wait in. And just yeah, to go ahead, Mark. Very, very quickly, just so Jackie referenced the, you know, what's known as wet weather consumption. And so what you do is you base consumption based on their wet winter condition because some businesses have irrigation. So instead of that way, you're not, they're not being charged sewer for their irrigation. So you do a wet weather consumption of water usage, which is the basis then for the sewer consumption value. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. I live with this stuff every day. So I just think everybody's in my brain. So yeah, it's usually the four months of the winter time is what the um, sewer rates are based on. Yeah, so I was just going to add, um, and this is mainly, I think, maybe for Mark, uh, as a reminder, as a refresher, kind of where are we at with this water sewer rate study analysis type work? So currently, we are gathering data and providing data to our consultant, Katie Isaacson, who's putting together a model to look at um, what adjustments may be needed to keep pace with our growing capital projects and needs that would be sewer funded, while also considering the impact of our capital facilities charges, our growth, paying for the growth, and our operating rates contributing their portion to uh, replacing and rehabbing our infrastructure. So we're providing data to Katie based on our current operations uh, for our utilities, both water and sewer, on the revenue side as well as expense side. And we're looking at our debt portfolio moving forward, kind of anticipating what those debt payments are gonna look like and how we've already defined um, where those should be paid from, from operating or from capital facility charges. Um, and, and while we're gathering all that work, this was um, one of the primary discussions that we had as far as um, making an improvement to our sewer structure. Because um, if you get on our, our, our Port Orchard Municipal Code, go to Chapter 13, go to Fees and Structures, you can see the 20 different rates uh, classes for sewer billing on a monthly basis. So from an administrative standpoint, it is cumbersome. Um, we also get feedback from the business community that they don't like it, they don't think it makes sense. They want us to come out and check their fixtures to see if we have the right number of fixtures within their facilities and have we defined their facility correctly for the right billing. So there's a lot of administrative work we have to do to verify and validate uh, the current 20 different rate classes that we are charging our customers. And so when we looked at our, our partners here, uh, you see a lot of them just have a simple base fee plus usage or plus consumption. It's a very simple model um, from, a, from that standpoint that you have this simple base fee just for your access to the system and then you're being charged for uh, your consumption, your use of the system. And you can apply this theory both to the water side as well as the sewer side. So from a policy perspective, that's what we're looking at is um, does it make sense? Would the council support this? They kind of move into this different structure rather than having 20 different classes on the commercial front, move into a base plus consumption. Um, and, and then also kind of simultaneously looking at that on the water side as well, establishing a, a simple base and then uh, plus consumption so that the uh, residential users are paying for the water that, that they're consuming. Now on the billing side, we hear about that quite frequently from those, I would say, I'm um, just giving an example, single, single uh, person in household, low usage, uh, they feel their bills too high, they do all the right things to conserve water, why should my bill be as high as you know, a family of five? Um, and it's again, due to our rate structure, how it's set up that there's these different tiers of bases, and then you get into this other layer of consumption once you get further out. So we're exploring the idea of a simple base fee, then uh, a fixed base fee, I will say too, uh, that does not involve consumption, and then the plus consumption charge on top, so that you are truly paying for the water that you are using in addition to a, a, a fixed base fee. Isn't that gonna be a little tricky coming up with that fixed base fee? Uh, there, there will be some math involved. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be a little tricky, I guess. Um, uh, there will be different approaches that we'll look at. I, I think the the tricky the trickier element of this kind of policy and, and, and structural change is whether administratively we can execute on this. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that it's a challenge is because we have partners in Bremerton that overlap in our city, and so we might provide sewer, but they provide the water. So they have all the water data, and so that's gonna be a challenge, I think, for us to sync up our billing cycles with them to get the data we would need to move to this consumption-based uh, approach. And, and the same is true as West Sound. We have some overlap there as well. So we have uh, calls into both our partners, both Bremerton and West Sound, to talk with them about their data, um, when they do their meter reading, 
when they could provide that to us so that we can answer the question, is it a practical application? Can we practically do it? Because there would be additional administrative work to this on our side, uh, again, having to get data from our partners and ensure that it's um, valid data, that the, they've done their meter checks, that the consumption is good to bring it in and then to be able to bill it on our side. So I think there's some practical applications that we're still sorting through, um, but we wanted to kind of at least as an early touch, uh, kind of float the concept that we're looking at. Um, although I might come back next week and say, it's just not practical. We met with Bremerton, we met with West Sound. I just can't get the data. It's just not gonna work. You know, it's a good theory. It sounds really simple, clean, great. Um, and if, if every uh, one of our customers was within our borders, we could do it. And the other option um, is, uh, um, of a potentially making this work is if we were moving towards radio reads, where it's more live data at the meter, uh, meaning we could extract the data as a radio read rather than our handheld kind of meter touches. And I know Bremerton is uh, moving that direction right now with their radio reads on their meters, so they're in implementing that. Um, but that's not where we're at today. So, so Noah, uh, if I could, if I can ask, and I just want to clarify that. Um, we are, when you say uh, about whether it's possible to do, you're talking about the um, using the con sewer consumption on or the water consumption for commercial for billing commercial accounts on sewer, and the, this this rate structure for water is absolutely doable. Right. When, so, would, you, when would you want to have this um, begin this this new rate structure? Well, that's what I was going to address. So what? What we're planning on right now is this is just an introduction to the utility committee only on this considerations, goals, and okay. results. Okay. Then finance is going to be reaching out and seeing if it's if it's feasible. Is it is it doable? Right. So then the plan we're going to come back in June at the June utility committee meeting and do an update. Okay, based on what we find which is either yay or nay then we're gonna the plan is then to proceed to the get a recommendation from the utility committee to take this now to the work study um, on the 21st okay all right so, so we'll, we'll know more on the uh, 614 uh, utility committee meeting and then then you'll provide direction that whatever it is, then we'll, and that's when Katie will come and give the presentation of all the numbers and all the rates and all the values that we didn't find, we didn't think that there was any value and there's no reason to start throwing numbers up yet because we don't know what they are yet. Mm -hmm. We're, we've got the basis input and Katie, you know, Katie, she's built her spreadsheets and she's ready to go, but there's some missing unknown numbers and kind of this policy piece that we need to, we need to vet it. So that's kind of the schedule. Okay, great. So there's one other piece of this that I can speak to, and that is what are our assumptions for the growth in our ratepayer base? And so we are currently, um, I've been providing data on permitting activity and when we expect units to become occupied to our consultant. And so we're using some assumptions right now. And I, I talked to the mayor yesterday about this, and I know that he is concerned that um, you know, if we if we assume too little rate pair growth, it means that the rate study is going to show that rates need to be higher rather than lower. And if we show too much um, uh, rate pair growth, um, I, I guess it, he he wanted to err on the side of let's let's be realistic with what's going to happen rather than being conservative and how much growth we expect for the purpose of setting rates because it's going to negatively affect uh, rate pairs. So. Um, I can share my screen real quick um, and show you, although somebody has to give me permission. Go ahead. The, um, uh, we just had this table sent over today that basically shows our, our current assumptions. And so the, the orange line is based on when permit, uh, permits are issued, which is different than the occupied line. And so uh, ignore the nine for 2021. We definitely had more units than nine occupied in 2021, but we're expecting 426 units to become occupied during the 2022 calendar year. Those units will not all be occupied for the entire year. It's probably some of them will be three months. Some of them will be six months. 
but the number that we're proposing to assume for at least the next three years, because we have so much activity, is quite a bit higher than the long-term uh, 100 units per year that we expect to add to the system. And so we're, we're trying to nail down a safe kind of middle of the road number that's not too high, not too low. And, um, you know, if we were to err on the, the higher side, if we were to bump 300 up to 400, it's actually going to depress the actual uh, suggested rate increases. But I think, uh, Noah, I, I don't know how you feel about these numbers at this point, but I think we're, we're kind of settling on this approach for um, how much how much rate payer growth we're going to see over the six year period. Yeah, I think, I think again, I'm gonna go back to, we're really early on in this analysis. Um, so what the assumptions we are looking at now might change, especially as we're, again, scrubbing the data, I still need to provide updated um, salary and benefits information to Katie for forecasting our operations. So there's a number of variables that are gonna change uh, from where we're at. But I think what we wanted was to just a quick touch base with the utility committee and to get your quick feedback on this uh, the theoretical kind of base plus consumption concept um, because it would be a structural different change. So it would really be a policy discussion. Um, and I think that's all we really wanted to kind of touch base with you guys on. And Jackie, correct me if I'm wrong. Because um, if you guys came back and said, hey, we're totally against this, then there's no use in us spinning our wheels and trying to look at whether it's a practical um, solution. I think it would be amazing if we, if we could get it to work, considering how many categories we have now. And I only think that'll grow. So I think we're gonna have to, I think this is a good idea. Yeah, and Cindy, um, I just, again, wanna clarify that there are actually two questions. If you look at the, um, at the agenda, there are actually two questions that we're really kind of asking you for preliminary consideration. And that is the commercial sewer rates that Noah was just talking about. The other right. one is taking that water base charge down to zero consumption so that we're charging for every bit of water rather than allowing people some water built into the base rate so that no matter how much you know, a, a single individual living by themselves conserves water, they're still going to pay the same rate. And that's what we hear a lot of complaining about. So, so those are really two questions for, for you. So I, I've got a little bit of questioning and, and concern, I guess, about a singular base for businesses. Um, because I think, you know, Noah, you mentioned, um, I think it was Noah uh, yeah. coming back from the public saying, well, I've only got one person in my household and why should I pay as much as somebody with five people in their household? Aren't you going to get the same feedback from businesses where you have a, a singular or maybe a, a two employee business and they're wondering why they're on the same base as Evergreen Lumber or, you know, one of the larger uh, employees, employers here in the, in the city? Yeah, and we've had that feedback from businesses that are, say, an office, right, that have maybe a sink, and they're paying the same rate of, say, a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's a great example. I'd have to look at the code uh, to pull up a better one. But in theory, that's the comments we get back is, why am I paying such a high base rate when it's just me and my, you know, computer, and I'm not using water. I'm not, I'm not doing anything consumption-wise. Why, why should I have to be subject to the same fee? as you know several floor a uh, retail complex with public right. restrooms and and you kind of go yeah that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense um and the only reason they are is because they go by like fixture count even though they're not consuming the same volume of water or putting the same impact on our system and that's one of the main reasons that we were considering going with the sewer commercial accounts being charged by their water consumption because it's a more fair way of doing it yeah. I agree with that one entirely. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we have had that discussion with several businesses and they, and I, I'd say they make valid points. Um, especially when you look at the impact to the system um, from what they're doing there at their office place. So I think and then we've, and then we've had challenges where they say, well, we're going to remove that fixture then if that's what's driving up our cost. And then we have to work with DCD and public works to get an inspection done. Uh, to get into their facility to see if they remove the fixture. And that's just hard to, to manage 
over time, especially as you get new tenants come in and change the, the layout of their, their office space, add a fixture, right. take it out. So that becomes administratively hard and difficult on our end uh, to communicate and coordinate with the department. And then you got the business saying, hey, where's your inspector? Why isn't he coming out and doing this? And his priority is really, his or her priority is really on other inspections. Well, it, cer it certainly does make sense to try to, to whittle down those 20 different levels that we have right now. Um, Cause that administratively, yeah, that's gotta be really difficult. So um, I like the direction you guys are going personally. Yeah, I would add that I do as well. I guess uh, my only caveat, especially, you know, I really think moving the residential rates to a gallon use is a great way to go. But at the end of the day, we have to generate a certain amount of revenue to make sure that we can fund the utilities. So <clears throat> when you when you reduce somebody's bill down because they only use 10 gallons then somebody else is gonna to have to go up to make up that difference. So it'd be interesting to see how you can make that magic work. Mm -hmm. Are there other communities uh, around us that are using the system? Absolutely, this is, this is the trend and has been for the past 15 to 20 years. So Paulsville, Bremerton, all of them? Uh, I, I can't speak to them off the top of my head. The last time I did a rate study, I wasn't working for Port Orchard. I was in another part of the state. So I, I couldn't answer that right now. Okay. I don't think they are. I know that we've talked about going to wet weather consumption for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the, and we've always not moved ahead with it. I think to some degree, the water conservation piece uh, where we've been getting a lot more pressure to be more proactive on water conservation and you know rewarding that along with some of the stuff that came out of the downtown redevelopment conversations um, is really the genesis for this might be the time to finally move to this because I know um, we've talked about it in the past. Yeah if I can clarify um, Cindy if you were asking that question about the changes that we are thinking of in the sewer bills Yes, our neighbors are doing that. If you were talking about the questions that we're suggesting or the changes that we're suggesting in the water bills, that's, I don't know if other people right here in Kitsap County are using that. Well, I know that up North they are so, but I don't know about Bremerton and West Sound. Okay. Well, Katie have, will have more input on that. Uh, yes. She'll be presenting to us at a work study. Is that the idea then? Yeah, actually, we, we planned on having, I think we're going to have Katie at the next utility committee meeting, as well as the work, work study the following week. Isn't that right, Noah? Yeah, yeah, there's going to be more discussion. That's again, this is real early. I uh, yep. just wanted to touch base again on this policy direction. And it looks like I got three heads kind of nodding going, yeah, this is, we're not against it, but we'd like to see how the math is going to play out then. And, and we got a lot more work to do on that front. Um, yeah. But I see three heads and nine, so that's that's at least a good indication. Go forward and have conversations with Bremerton and West Sound on data, and uh, keep working with Katie on how to make this uh, a feasible approach. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, all done with that topic. Are we moving on to the Public Works Board projects? Okay. So the Public Works Board projects for the Melcher Pump Station and the 390 Booster Station, um, we have. Preliminarily chose uh, an engineering firm, Art Anderson, and they are getting us the scopes and budgets now. They were waiting on some more information from subs to come in. So we're hoping to have those um, contracts negotiated and to you, if not in May and early June. Um, the last one there, the sewer lift station upgrade, that is going to be something that we don't normally do. Um, in as far as being rather than just a regular um, consulting and design um, contract, this will be a design build because the people that we use for um, our um, telemetry and SCADA system and controls um, are the ones that can build it. So we're looking at doing a design build and Mark has been looking at that. Yeah, it's 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 like a two-edged sword. On the one hand, this project reeks of, it has to be designed because otherwise 
we could have somebody design some sort of system that can be pr 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 proprietary. And now we have TSI, our uh, SCADA system provider, that's now not in the loop because somebody else comes in with some different equipment and then there's a problem. Um, so the good news is the design build allows us to put together a team that TSI with somebody else designs it and builds it, right? The downside is the design build process is much more complicated and it actually involves really hiring uh, a firm that does design build and then they bring in who they need to bring in. So that's why we're, you know, we're, we're as far as the public works board, we're finishing up obviously the pottery lift station. It's up and running, but we're still, we're still waiting to close that out with the PWB. We're going to have these two projects, you know, underway with the public works board. And once we get those rolling, then we can, then we can go back and just focus on, uh, you know, this design build process. So we want to get these guys out of the way. And then what was the other one, Jackie, that we already issued? No, no there, there were four of them. The other one's Pottery. Pottery, Melcher, 390, and the lift stations. Were four, those were the four. Yeah, so we've got one of them done, two of them are ready, almost ready to go, and then, then we'll jump on this design build just because it's a bit more complicated. Okay. And then uh, the Bay Street lift station update. Okay, so this is not really an update. That's why I don't have update on there. This is kind of a new thing um, that has just recently come up. Uh, the, Bay Street, the Bay Street lift station is a, is a smaller lift station uh, uh, compared to some of our others. And it's actually in the parking lot of the Ford dealership. Um, we have no room to expand. There's, I didn't even approach the Ford dealership because I'm, I'm sure they, they want, we, we know they want us out of there because we're taking up one, of their, one or two of their parking spaces as it is, um, space that they can use for retail. So Tony and I put our heads together and I actually came across my desk that the RV place across the street, um, that building is for sale. And so I have contacted, I've done initial contacts with the um, real estate brokers to see if there's any opportunity for us to either obtain an easement or buy a small piece of, pro of the property. Because if this map that shows, this is where the building actually sits right here. And you can see that that property is really big. So what we were thinking was possibly Wait. back here or over here where it's close to that hillside. Jackie, we're not seeing your screen. We're not seeing your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So try Jackie, again here. But Jackie's bringing it up. Let me give you a little bit of background. So the current Marina pump station is actually located in the right of way of SR 166. No, I'm sorry, B. You said Marina. I think. Yeah. Know. Which one are we talking about? I mean, the base, the base street pump station is, right. is, is, you know, it's like pushed right up. It's squeezed in. It's near and, the sidewalk. Yeah. And it's, and so remember when Bay Ford Titus was moving ahead with his whole new Ford dealership, mm -hmm. when we were working with him on that shoreline development permit, they were providing us with easement to, to expand. That, that permit is subsequently expired because he's not moving ahead with that project. So, so if there was a new development shoreline permit as part of that process on the north side of Bay, we would, you know, we still have the opportunity to, as part of the design, you know, expand on that side of the road. What Jackie and Tony are looking at is, if Bay Ford just doesn't do anything or if they don't sell it to somebody to build something else, this is just an opportunity, if we can, to, to obtain property on the south side so that we can ultimately just abandon that facility in the future. So, you know, we've already had money in the budget for, you know, upgrade of this facility, but quite honestly, it's always been a Band-Aid approach because we were space limited. So this is a scenario where if, if we are able to potentially get enough real estate by an easement or uh, you know fee simple um, that we can put a pump station on in the future that then we can then we have the ability to just as part of the project get the sewer you know because all all this pump station does is it 
takes everything from the east side of town and pumps it back to the marina pump station. So this is kind of a introduction fees feasibility at this point. Uh, to see we can make something work. Mark, do we still own property on the uh, west side of Blackjack that the dealership is using? Yeah, we do, but I think that's going to be way too close because of the setbacks and all. No, I, I appreciate it's way too close, but it is trading stock. It It is, I think it is for somebody in the future that if Titus decides to sell, and the problem is he's just let his stuff expire and there hasn't been really much conversation about what he may or may not do in the future. This is- Isn't that property leased to him? <laughs> Yeah, he has Quisenberry. Quisenberry still still owns it, but he has an active lease. No, we well, no Quisenberry owns Bay Ford to the east. Right. Midas owns the old, uh, you know, the the building that used to be there between the hotel. Right. The hotel. right. Yeah. So he owns the property that the Bay Street is adjacent to. Yeah. So it may not be of interest for Titus to have better use of that property along the creek in exchange for a bigger footprint for our pump station. Not until he ultimately purchases from Quisenberry, yeah. Okay. That involves a cleanup, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, isn't that property contaminated? No. The old uh, Les Schwab or whatever it is? Quisenberry, Quisenberry did all the cleanup on everything but a tiny little square that's under the northeast corner of the existing Bay Ford build. When he, oh. when Quisenberry bought that from Howe Oil and Heating, there was actually an insurance policy that went with that property. So remember when we did the that segment for the bridge, mm -hmm. we had them clean up under our 20 foot easement so that we could build our pathway then Quisenberry then did the rest of the exterior, but there's this piece that Titus and Quisenberry have been fighting over under the building where Quisenberry doesn't want to touch it, and Ecology agrees that until that building gets demolished, there's no reason to touch it, and it's been in, it's been uh, encased from the outside, or enveloped, so that nothing's going to migrate into the area that's been cleaned. Well, I need me to take on a rabbit hole. I was just curious. <laughs> and the reason the reason that we've been talking about this, that Tony and I initially started talking about this and trying to think outside the box, if you will, is because with this um, lift station over here, um, we're just, I mean, we're pretty close to capacity there with, with what can go through there. And right here is where West Sound Group is putting in a four-story, 117-unit multifamily and uh, retail space um, building buildings here, and so I have I've I've asked for a scope and budget um, from our um, consulting engineers to make sure that we have still have capacity enough in the Bay Street Station as it is. So and there is no place to put a generator, and that's a pretty critical piece of infrastructure to ensure that we don't have an, a spill into the creek here. So that's why we kind of started looking at that. So I guess. This is the question to put before the utility committee is shall shall we still keep working on this and seeing if what kind of options might be out there for us. Just a real weird question is there's no possibility of bypassing the marina pump station is there and having that uh, base street lift station go into the system closer to the sewer plant. We, we looked at that. Oh, 2010 I think we looked at. Is there a way to not pump everything back to Marina and back? And there, there isn't. Mm. And then the other thing too is Heron's view is the only thing that's currently on the books. But if mm -hmm. I were a betting, if I were a betting man, mm -hmm. I would say that in the next 10 to 20 years, West Bay Center, Bay Ford, and uh, yeah. that other property are all going to be mixed use. Yep. When we and so Jackie, when we're looking at the sizing of that, mm. we need to not be looking at just Heron's view. We need to be looking at oh, those, those absolutely. properties. If if we're gonna rebuild, if we're gonna do a project like this, it needs to be for what Nick can look into his crystal ball and see way down the road. 
there's also that stuff that's up on Bethel that bros right thing. so there's there's a lot of development potential that we're going to need to plan for capacity wise so we're going to need a fairly large facility right so again that's that's why I put it on the agenda this time I was just kind of looking for direction from the from the council to see if you were or from the utility committee to see if that was something that we should continue to pursue and see what what options we have i think it's worth looking at personally okay all right agreed, agreed. Mm -hmm. okay well that's that's all we've got um hey, Mark, I, I do have a a, a question you you mentioned cindy brought up a good point about pushing all that stuff straight to the to the uh, sewer plant and you say there's no way there's no way possible to do that um, can you can you kind of clarify that for me I don't understand why there wouldn't be well cost ramifications from the, from the marina pump station you've got a 16 inch force main that runs so everything from you know McCormick on the west side of town and then everything on the east side and they go into the marina pump station so you've got a very high pressure high flow force main that then runs from marina pump station all the way to the headworks of the treatment plant so to push that all the way to the treatment plant you're either trying to pump into an extremely high flow high pressure existing system or run a parallel line so it's much more cost effective to just upgrade this system and let it continue to go unless unless we get into pipe capacity issues where the existing system that run, runs back to the west then then we may need to look at it. but and then we would because there there's always been a plan to put a second force main in um so you know that's just something that would be considered that if if when we do this analysis to see what this pump station really is going to carry in the next you know 50 years if if the sewer lines need to be completely enlarged to very large you know 12 or 12 inch pipe just to get it to the marina pump station and then back and now now we've got to build the the second force main then yeah then it would make sense just to say from marina pump station to bay street that existing force main that's there has plenty of capacity and now you're running parallel right. lines because really the east side of town has never been the the big push right it was always from the west but now that we're getting all this downtown redevelopment and potential to the east will that growth you know project over uh, the marina pump station's capacity so to speak and that you're right so Jackie and you know anybody moving forward, we always need to keep that in mind that there will be a limit at which you know it's kind of a time and development equation that right now the, the model says to run it back from the marina pump station. But 10 years from now, that could change completely with growth on the east east side of town. Mark, just a crazy question. Will the city ever acquire West Sum? Yep. Oh yeah, it'll happen. Yeah, it. I would say we will absorb West Sound in the next ten years. Uh huh. Just based on of absorbing them, not buying them, Sydney. Yeah, right. We're, we're right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say get based on current growth, and because there's an equation that I'm not. I know that it has to do with percentage of area service area and um, well as we annex more of their area that there's a percentage as mark is suggesting at that point we just absorb them right. mm -hmm. yeah west sound has continued to expand to keep one step ahead of us but i think <laughs> right I think at some point that will uh you know that will peter out and uh, yeah 10 to 20 years definitely we'll be absorbing west sound Okay. Hey Mark, where does the, the current sewer run or flow go from, say, the High Point Shopping Center, uh, High Joy, and Town Square Mall? Does that head down Bay Street? Yeah, that all runs down. 
until it comes. So the base three comes up, in. and then up, and then the marina, and then back out. Yeah, gotcha. And okay, then everything, you. then everything coming off the hill, Farragut, South Gets Up High School, you know, all that stuff comes down, and so yeah. It gets a lot of mileage in, actually. It does. Yeah, yep. it goes from almost the treatment plant all the way back to the marina pump station. and All the way from McCormick, even, you know? It's well mixed by the time. It is. Know. It's a, right. <laughs> Definitely some tired fins on those wrinkle neck brown trout. <laughs> oh, dear. All anyway. right. <laughs> Any more discussion? Are we done pretty much? I just have I just have a, a real quick um, just to give you a little reminder. Next Wednesday is our sub, um, sewer advisory council meeting. And this one's going to be an in-person meeting at West Sound Utility District at West Sound's request because they've got an audits coming up and they need signed minutes. But we will have a Teams availability if you're not able to make it to the West Sound and uh, Randy has got that set up. So um, FYI. No, where's the meeting at, Jackie? I'm sorry? Where is it at their offices? or At, the, at their office, yes, at their office on, on Lund. We okay. Should, we should see if we could do it down at the treatment plant for Mark's benefit so he can see the treatment plant and maybe tour it. Isn't, isn't there cookies involved or something? There like are. That? Oh, definitely. Oatmeal. Oatmeal. <laughs> That's the new guy cookies. on the block is to bring the cookies. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was the oldest guy on the block. No, the new guys. And I, the old guys advise the new guys don't drink the water that they offer. <laughs> Only this bottle. Yeah. Uh, I, can yeah. <laughs> I can certainly make that request that we move it if you'd like. Let's do that. Yeah. That's, okay. a good, that's a good idea. They've got a great view too. And the smell is wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, with the cookies. And you, <laughs> what's the time frame? Um, the meeting, a, meeting is at 6.30. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Usually well, Randy Spruce brings the cookies, though, and he does both. They usually have them. Yeah, I don't cookies. think we have to worry about that. He gets the Costco cookies. So. Yeah. You can see the moisture gets squeezed out. It's really kind of fun. All okay. right. I will contact Randy tomorrow. Are we Thank finished? you. We're finished and we'll see you in just a little bit. Okay, what is it? It's 5.52. Okay, thank in you.